I want to introduce a theological term that may be unfamiliar, at least to some of you, I'm going to assume, which is apophatic theology. Anyone know? Yay. Uh, so apo apophatic theology is also sometimes referred to as negative theology. Uh, the idea that it is theology and pondering the mystery of God based on the conviction of the God who is wholly unknowable. And I have been reminded lately of my love for Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, because whenever I go visit our esteemed and beloved um, uh, Bill McCullough, he often wants to talk about Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, who was a great uh, mystical theologian and one of the great fathers of apophatic, negative theology. And he writes that unknowing or agnosia is not ignorance or absence of knowledge as ordinarily understood, but rather the realization that no finite knowledge can fully know the infinite one, and that therefore he is only truly to be approached by agnosia or by, or by that which is beyond or above knowledge. And I think it is a powerful way for us to begin to enter into what we hear this morning as the greatest commandment, which is indeed to love God. Connected to the other great commandment, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And these are probably familiar to us. We have much swag and merch in the Diocese of Ohio with Love God, Love Your Neighbor, Change the World on it. Many of you might be interested. I'm sure we have a bunch of t-shirts in the basement of the parish house. With those, if anyone wants one, come see me. I can probably find you one. And I think we're fairly good at the love your neighbor bit. I mean, we might not always be good at practicing it. Uh, and I think especially in the Episcopal Church, our particular sin is often to equate niceness with love, civility with love, not being contentious or controversial or not making waves with love. And I think that is a truth for us to sit with in this world. But at least like philosophically and conceptually, we get the idea of loving our neighbor. Loving God is a lot weirder. It is a lot more abstract. And there are some very real reasons that make it difficult for us to love God, frankly. Many of us may bear very, very real religious trauma. I have had friends, dear friends, who cannot enter a church without coming close to having a panic attack because they have been so deeply hurt by the people who claim to represent God. And I think that is very real and important for us to name. But I also think it's just hard to love God because God is so big. God is so wholly other. The concept of loving our neighbor makes sense because we can see our neighbor standing right in front of us. And God is an abstraction. The otherness, the unknowability of God can make it seem like a weird and strange commandment 
to actually love God. But I sort of want to turn that around a little bit this morning and actually say that I think it is precisely the unknowability, the otherness, the mystery of God that is precisely what we are supposed to love. And the more we lean into that, the more we lean into the otherness of God, the more we lean into the awe and wonder of God, the more we are, in fact, able to truly love our neighbor as God has called us to do. If we think about it, some of the some of the, the entities, the churches, the individuals, uh, even within ourselves, the times that we fail dramatically to love our neighbor is when we are leaning into a particular form of certainty and conviction about righteousness as we approach our understanding of God, right? And it is, it is very easy to point to Perhaps the churches that we know all too well, perhaps some of us came from, that use convictions about righteousness and certainty of their own perception of God to marginalize members of the LGBTQ plus community, anyone deemed to be unworthy or unrighteous, right? But... That is true, frankly, across the religious, theological, and political spectrum as well. I roll my eyes a little bit at the boogeyman of cancel culture, but we know that it is very true that we live in quite a punitive society where we can get so convicted of our rightness and our righteousness and our zeal for our convictions that we do indeed forego the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. I think it is worth noting that this Sunday, and here I give a shout out to our Lutheran contingent, but this Sunday is often referred to as Reformation Sunday in some Protestant churches. The Sunday closest to October 31st, All Hallows' Eve, when in 1517 Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the cathedral in Wittenberg and began the Protestant Reformation. And it, this is held up as a celebration of the renewal of theology in the Reformation and the birth of the Protestant tradition of which we are a part. And maybe it is, this is, this is, I will throw this out because we have discussed it in CHS in the past, maybe it is fitting for a movement that largely began as a result of Martin Luther's constipation. True story, you can look it up. Uh, he had some issues, um, did a lot of pondering on the toilet, very much a historical fact. That the Protestant Reformation, though it gave birth to our churches and it gave birth to a renewal of theology for which we can be grateful, it also led to a time in church history when factions of Christians convict, convicted of their own rightness, convicted of their conception of God, just murdered each other for random theolog like murdering each other for whether you baptize as babies or baptize as adults. That is not the love of God that gives birth to love of neighbor. And as much as we can celebrate the Reformation and what it produced in terms of our own tradition and hold that with thanksgiving, I think we can also hold it as a time of repentance and grief when factions and zeal and righteousness were held as more important.
Muslims than our ultimate commandment to live in love with one another. And I wonder if perhaps the act and humility of sitting before awe and wonder of God, sitting before the God who is wholly unknowable, loving the mystery of God, actually allows us to behold in one another the wonder and mystery, to look at one another with humility, awe, recognizing that each human person is indeed created in the image of the God that we are called to behold with love and wonderance, wonder and reverence. I think it is very telling that the central act of our church, that indeed, though we are Protestants, we share with our Catholic and Orthodox siblings, is the sacraments of the Eucharist. When we come not to try to understand God or comprehend God, but to receive God, to be in communion with God, and in so doing, to be in communion with each person who is gathered around the altar and shares in the bread and the wine. And I wonder what it truly means for us to lean into the love of the God who is unknowable, and to allow that to inform and infuse our absolutely radical love of one another, and in so doing, conceive of how we might actually change this world. Amen.